Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth and last in this term series of BCLT research seminars in literary translation. Uh, before we go any further, can I just ask you please to make sure your camera is turned off and your microphone muted. Uh, we have a lot of people registered in advance for this seminar, so we need to make sure that the sound quality is not impaired. My name is Duncan Large and I'm the Academic Director of the British Centre for Literary Translation, which is based at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. This year's BCLT seminars are taking place online and as a consequence, we're delighted to be able to welcome many new audience members. I know that uh, that's the case, especially for this afternoon's seminar. And let me extend a particularly warm welcome to those of you uh, joining us today from India. If you haven't joined us for an event before and would like to find out more about the British Centre for Literary Translation, please check out uh, our social media channels at BCLT UEA. And on the web, we are bclt.org.au. UK and uh, there you can sign up for our newsletter and find out all kinds of information about our activities. Our speaker this afternoon is Shayantan Dasgupta. Shayantan is Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Comparative Literature at Jadavpur University in Kolkata, India. A former Charles Wallace India Trust Translation Fellow at UEA in 2010. He established CENTIL, the Centre for the Translation of Indian Literatures at Jadavpur, and currently serves as the Secretary of the Comparative Literature Association of India, and as a member of the Advisory Board English of the Sahitya Academy, India's national body of letters. Sayantan's book publications include as translator, uh, Girish Chandra Ghosh's Tit for Tat 2008, and as editor, A Season of Stories, Contemporary Indian Short Stories in Translation 2003, Call of the Hills, a course book of Indian Nepali literature in translation 2012-2016, and most recently, just uh, a few weeks ago, in fact, uh, Dalit Lekhika, Women's Writing in Bangla 2020. With Lakshmi Holmstrom and fellow Charles Wallace alumna Sanjukta Dasgupta, Sayantan also published Translation, Roles, Responsibilities and Boundaries in 2012. He's a founder member of UEA's Humanities in India Steering Group and is principal investigator of the Jadapur University uh, project on redefining Indian literature, archiving and translating indigenous and marginalized traditions. Shantan has been a long-term partner and friend of BCLT and the University of East Anglia, so it's a particular pleasure to be able to invite him to speak to us this evening. In addition to his residency as Charles Wallace India Trust Translation Fellow 10 years ago, he's returned to UEA several times since in March 2017 for a curriculum development workshop organized by Daniel Rycroft and the UEA Humanities in India project. Uh, then in April last year, 2019, as Vice Chancellor's Global Challenges Research Fellow. I'm only sorry that we can't physically welcome Shayantan to campus again this evening, but I suspect it won't be long before we're able to do so again. Now, uh, before I hand over, let me just say a couple of things about the logistics of today's session. Uh, we are recording this session and we'll be making it available afterwards on BCLT's YouTube channel. So do please, as I mentioned before, uh, mute your microphones and keep your uh, your video switched off. Uh, do please feel free though to ask questions via the chat function and I'll put them to Shantan on your behalf at the end of his presentation. Let me now uh, with great pleasure then hand over to Shantan Dasgupta for this afternoon's talk uh, which has the title Englishing India Turn of the Century Translation Practices. Time. Welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Duncan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank the 
British Center for Literary Translation for giving me this opportunity of sharing my work with you on this platform. My presentation is titled Englishing India, Turn of the Century Translation Practices. And I'm going to try and look at uh, English language translations of Indian Bhasha literature from around the last decade, the 1990s, and the first decade of the next century, so around 20 years. Um, and I'm going to try and look at a sample, uh, a sampling of translations from this period and try to look at certain patterns to see if these patterns can be seen to be emerging from this sampling of translations. And for this presentation, uh, this is actually a modified version of my paper, Translating India Today, Local Cultures, Global Ambitions and Colonial Hangovers, which was published uh, in an anthology called Locating Cultural Change by Sage some time ago. I have a PowerPoint to go with this, so I will just uh, load the PowerPoint right away and begin. Right, so these are actually very exciting times to be doing the humanities in India because things are constantly in flux. And over the last few decades, we have been seeing major changes overtaking practices in the humanities. The humanities today in India no longer means what it used to 20 years back. And what you expect from the humanities is very, very different from what you would have expected uh, a couple of decades back. There are significant changes that we have seen happening over the last uh, few uh, years, in fact. Uh, what has happened is there has been a radical reformulation of curricula across various departments in the humanities, across universities all over India. And by and large, the curricula has tended to become more inclusive and also interdisciplinary. So there is more scope today for cross-pollination in the humanities in India than there ever was. There is more scope with the curricula being expanded in the way it is for uh, people from scholars from history to contribute to departments of literature and vice versa and so on and so forth. And there's the emergence of fields such as digital humanities, which again, is predicated upon interdisciplinarity and interdepartmentality. All of these things mean that uh, there are a lot of exciting developments taking place right now in the humanities in India. Another development has been the emergence of private universities, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. And there are many good spin-offs. There are many bad spin-offs of the move towards privatization. One of the interesting things that we see is that in their effort to make their courses more market friendly, uh, private universities have often in many cases come up with courses and programs that actually go against the rigid division between departments that used to be there. Uh, so these are some of the major changes uh, which are resulting in uh, a radical reformulation and reinvention of the humanities in India. And one of the spin-offs of this, one of the ways in which these changes are manifesting themselves has been in the way the humanities pedagogy has uh, tended to accommodate translation today. More and more uh, use is being made of literature in translation in the university classroom. There was a time when this was uh, almost not done, but over the last few decades, many departments of literature uh, have gone on to include literature in translation within their curriculum. And today, we find departments of English teaching, apart from English literature, of course, Sanskrit literature, French literary texts, Bangla literary texts, and so on and so forth. The same 
is of course true of comparative literature departments as well because comparative literature is predicated upon uh, espousing the multiple, the plural. So uh, the same kind of thing we are seeing in multiple departments across India. What I suggest we are actually witnessing today in the humanities in India is perhaps a moving away from an exclusive focus on in-depth study to a model of pedagogy that accommodates in breadth study as well. We are probably moving away from solely focusing on the vertical axis of one language literature tradition to accommodating a more horizontal axis within our pedagogy. What are the repercussions of this? What this means is that perhaps our departments, our universities are opening up, uh, opening up more easily now to the larger global network of literary production, rather than focusing on language-based literary studies. This is not an entirely new phenomenon, of course. This has been gradually happening over the last several years, over the last many years. Uh, in fact, one can probably take it back to the 1970s at least, uh, because uh, one of the first moves to consciously and in a sustained way incorporate the uh, literature of India, the literature from different languages of India in translation within the university curriculum happened in the late 1970s when the Department of Comparative Literature, the sole Department of Comparative Literature in India at that point, refurbished its syllabus to incorporate Indian literature in translation. Uh, at that time, this was quite a novel thing because uh, it was still the language access that was being privileged. And this was really the exception rather than the rule. But since the 1970s, over the next few decades, uh, various departments, uh, uh, of literature, of literary studies in India have actually followed this trend, which is why today we find translations being taught, being read in the classroom more and more frequently. And I think this is a trend that is going to carry on for some time. The reason this is important is the moment we have literature in translation, literary works being taught in translation in the classroom, we are bound to encounter questions about the process, the act, the exercise of translation itself. When a novel like River of Fire, which is the English translation of an Urdu novel called Aag Ka Darya, written by Kurutulin Haider, when the English translation is incorporated within the curriculum of an English literature department, or a comparative literature department, students and teachers are bound to raise the question about the authenticity of the text. What is River of Fire? How different is it from Akkadarya? What is the process by which this book reaches the classroom? And in this case, a little bit of probing will immediately bring to the fore uh, the, the very difficult, the very uh, uh, complicated history of this translation. Because here is the case of a text which has been translated by the author herself. And the English translation is quite different from the Urdu original in terms of the structure of the text. We have three chapters being fused together to make up one chapter in the English translation. Sometimes we have multiple chapters becoming one chapter. Sometimes we have a single chapter in the original giving rise to two or three different chapters in the translation. Not just that, you have new chapters or uh, uh, new titles for the chapters, titles which are tailor-made for what is perceived to be the English-speaking audience. The Forest of Arden, for instance, turns out to be, to be the name of one of the chapters in the English translation which is completely an addition compared to the Urdu version. So what I'm trying to point to is the fact that questions of translation are becoming more and more important in the humanities classrooms in India today. 
as we read more literature in translation in the classroom, more and more questions regarding translation are coming up and it is becoming more and more important for us to interrogate current practices of translation in India. The relationships between local cultures, global ambitions and colonial hangovers, all of these need to be interrogated afresh in this climate when translations are becoming so much more important. We remember Shujit Mukherjee's comments on translation as patriotism. These are comments he made in his book, Translation as Discovery, which was published in 1994. And Shujit Mukherjee points to the fact that in the colonial era, there is a substantial relationship between translation exercises and discourses of patriotism. What is more interesting to note is that in the post-colonial era, this relationship tends to continue in India. There is a clear uh, atat, a relationship between translation in India and discourses of nationalism and patriotism, even after 1947. This is true of exotropic translation, of course, because when we have Indian literature being translated into a foreign language, primarily English, by and large, most of the exotropic translation happens into English, um, you, you tend to view these translations as uh, the public face, uh, the international face of India. In fact, that is one of the objectives with which the Sahitya Academy, the national body of letters in India, was set up in 1954, which was to foreground the riches of Indian literature to the world through translation into English. What is true of exotropic translation is also true of endotropic translation, translation of international literature into Indian languages, and also of intra-Indian literary translation, translation between and among the Indian bhashas. I think this uh, relationship of translation with patriotism in these two categories is amply evident in the works of scholars like Manubendra Bandhupadhyay, who historically made specific choices regarding which areas, which literary traditions they would be translating from when they translated into their own languages. It is something we can come back to if there is time, uh, but since it's not directly related to English language translation, uh, let me continue. The relationship between the national, the local and the global is of course particularly complicated in the case of Indian literature in English translation. Uh, up to the 1980s, the period up to the 1980s uh, is generally seen in India as um, a period that uh, sees translation activity being tied up with the quest for unity in diversity. So uh, the sheer diversity of India has always been a problem for India's national imaginary because there are so many languages and religions and cultures. Uh, we may have officially around 22 languages, but the People's Linguistic Survey of India, which recently concluded its work, came up with uh, around 700 languages for India. So this diversity has always meant, uh, 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 has always been a problem for Indian national imaginary. And uh, the Indian state has tried to negotiate this problem by, by serving up the slogan of unity in diversity. And that uh, has been evident in the realm of translation of Indian literature as well. The motto of the Sahitya Academy itself, for instance, which says Indian literature is one, though it is written in many different languages, it is testimony to this attempt. Something probably changes around the 1980s and the 1990s. Scholars like Rita Kotari have pointed to an efflorescence of 
Indian literature in English translation in these decades. So we see um, a large body of English translations of Indian literature cropping up in this period. We see many private publishers uh, venturing into the realm of translating and publishing English translations of Indian literature, not just as one of titles, but also as sustained series of translations. Um, there is also a reaction to this, uh, uh, for, and, and, and this reaction is what Manubendra Bandhupada is perhaps part of in his efforts uh, to take translation to the other extreme. Uh, as Indian literature in English translation becomes more and more visible, uh, we need to ask certain questions more and more urgently, questions about the sense of location of the translators, questions about the intended reader of this branch of writing, of this genre of publications. When we translate Indian Bhasha literature from Marathi, Gujarati, Bangla, Ohomia into English, who is the target audience that these translations are meant for? Because theoretically, it is possible to think of a reader uh, in any of the Anglophone countries, the UK, the USA, Canada, and so on and so forth, who might be reading these translations. But at the same time, it is equally possible that these translations might have for their readership uh, people in other states. So, you could, so we could imagine a reader in Gujarat reading Bangla novels in English translation, or a reader in Tamil Nadu uh, reading a Hindi short story in English translation. So at least two different broad categories of readership. Of course, these categories are themselves again fractured, but definitely at least two broad readerships we can think of. So the question that comes up is about the needs of these two kinds of readers. Would they be the same? or would there be a substantial qualitative difference between the needs of these two readerships? Because it is possible theoretically to think of um, a community of readers who may not share the language code of the original, but who may well share some of the culture code of the original. So for that kind of a readership, what kind of approach to translation would work? And for another readership, where the culture code and the language code are both, both beyond access, would the same kind of approach to translation work? Those are some of the questions that might come up. There's a set of questions that I was thinking of, which it may be instructive for us to ask in the context of Indian literature in English translation. These questions, center around the identity of the intended reader, but only to lead us to a larger question about the translator's understanding of the process of translation itself and its significance in the larger network of literary relations. And this is where Harish Trivedi's comments on post-colonial translation may turn out to be relevant for us. In his essay, The Politics of Postcolonial Translation, which is published in a book by Avdesh Kumar Singh in 1996, Trivedi asks the question of whether post-independence translations of Indian literature are postcolonial. And uh, he leaves off at the end on a rather ambiguous note without really being able to conclude that there is a postcolonial strand to translation activity in post-1947 India. Uh, so that is a question I think that we can still ask ourselves when we look at English translations of Indian Bhasha literature uh, uh, in the 1990s and later on as well. How far are the dynamics of post-colonial power equations ingrained within the translator's understandings of translation? Again, for understanding the translation industry in India, it may be instructive to think of the question when we have 
series of translations being published by different publishers. How far do we detect any kind of translation policy within this, these titles that constitute the series? Because it is possible that because these titles are part of a series, there is some kind of a frame in terms of the logic of translation, uh, in terms of this series envisages the relationship between the source language culture and the target language culture. But is that relationship, is that framework always there? Can one detect that? Again, on the question of culture specificities, uh, how far do the translations deal with culture specificities? Do they avoid dealing with them? Do they succumb to the bulldozing effect of the English language? Or uh, do they privilege the source language nuances and the specificities? There are various ways in which translators of Indian literature who have been translating into English have responded to this challenge. Sometimes uh, there are very dangerous pitfalls that uh, uh, dealing with culture specificities have, has thrown up. For instance, this word Sindur. Uh, there are occasions when the word Sindur uh, has been retained in the Roman script, in the English translation of a, of a story from Bangla or Ahomea. And the word Sindur is then annotated. But on many occasions, the annotation is such that it tends to become prescriptive several locations where Sindur has been defined in terms of uh, vermilion powder, which uh, women in India wear on the parting of their head to show that they are married. It becomes almost prescriptive. So these are very dangerous, uh, this is a very dangerous politics of annotation, which sometimes translations of Indian literature in English manage to succumb to. I would like to share with you um, a few points from these two books of translation. One is from Bangla, Moti Nondi's Striker Stopper, and the other is from Malayalam, M.T. Vasudevan Nair's Kalam. Both these books, incidentally, are published under the same imprint, the same publisher. Mihir Kedas, the translator of the Bangla uh, text, um, has a translator's note. And in the translator's note, he explains the intended readership of this translation. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a sports book, it's about football. So he writes that this translation is meant for Indian readers who love football. Indian readers who may not have access to Bangla, who would be reading this text in the English translation. So there's, there's a clear enunciation of what kind of a reader this translation is meant for. What about the practice of translation? How far does the translator's note uh, uh, sync with what kind of a uh, translation is done by the translator here? Well, we find words like kochuri and jelebi, both of which are snacks, food items in Bengal. Uh, these words are retained in the English translation. And there are no annotations, no explanations at all for these words. Incidentally, these are words that enjoy substantial currency across many languages in India. What is kochuri in one part of India would be kachori in another. What is jalebi in what part of India would be jalebi in another, GDP in another, and so on and so forth. But it is comprehensible to large parts of India. So obviously, because this translation is meant for an Indian reader, apparently, the translator feels no need to annotate or explain these words. We come to Gita Krishnan Kutti's translation of Kalam. Both, both Mihir Kedas and Gita Krishnan Kutti are experienced translators. They are excellent translators. Uh, but look at how different their strategies are over here. Gita Krishnan Kutti's translation boasts an extensive glossary, which is very different from Mihir Kedas's translation. Not just that, the translation of Kalam also has a glossary of kinship terms. 
Uh, kinship terms are always a bone of contention when you translate from an Indian language into English, because the word uncle, for instance, is about one of the largest baskets that we can think of. In the Indian context, there would be so many different kinds of uncles. So if one retains kaka, chacha, mama, jatha, piche, and so on and so forth, all of which are different kinds of uncles, then you need to gloss the kinship terms. That is what the translator's stance over here is. Not just a glossary and a glossary of kinship terms, but this translation even has a list of Malayalam months with the equivalents in the Gregorian calendar. We see how different the translation strategies are. Further, there are words, culture-specific words like Annaprasanam, Brahma Rakshashu, and Yakshi, which enjoy substantial currency in different languages. Annaprasanam in one language would be Onnoprasan in another, it would still be understood. So even these words, Gita Krishnan Kutti, feels need to be annotated, which means perhaps that the idea of the reader for this second translation is different from the idea of the reader from the first. Because an Indian reader would perhaps not uh, need extensive annotations to words that have substantial currency in India. Uh, there, are, there, there are several more examples of this. There is no point in going into that. But the point that I'm trying to make uh, is that while these two titles are part of the same series, brought out around the same time by the same publisher, the approaches to translation seem to be different and the idea of target reader seems to be very different. Now translation is of course a creative act and different translators will translate in different ways. They will bring their own ideas of translation into translation, of course. But when we are seeing two titles which are part of the same series, perhaps one also tends to look for some kind of a, an editorial policy, which uh, records a certain idea of readership, distribution, and so on and so forth. That seems to be uh, not entirely present when we look at these examples of titles that are published within the same series. This reminds us of Lakshmi Holmstrom's comments on the translation industry in India and on just how challenging the needs of the translation industry in India are because we are dealing with so many languages together. Ideally, copy editors um, in the publication houses would need to have access to the original language of the translated text. But it is almost impossible in the practical sense for publication houses to have copy editors who have access to all the languages from which the translations would be coming in. So very often you might have a manuscript being edited without uh, the original being looked at. Um, so, so these are just some of the challenges uh, of the translation industry in India. And uh, uh, editing translations is again a specialized activity. A translated manuscript cannot be edited in the way a different kind of a manuscript would be edited. Lakshmi Holmstrom raises the questions of how prepared we are in India for meeting these challenges, even as we are uh, going into hyperdrive with translation. Since the 1990s, there is a lot of translation happening, but uh, perhaps we need to also take stock and uh, uh, think about uh, what directions the translation industry needs to take, apart from publishing of translations, of course. Another example that I would share with you Shubodh Ghosh's shock therapy, which is translation from Bangla and Kutti Dati, V. Abdullah's translation of the Malayalam version from M.T. Vasudevan Nair. We see similar words being treated differently. Shock therapy takes up the word payesh, which is a sweet dish, milk and um, sugar and rice. The word payesh is translated into rice pudding, whereas kuttidati retains the original payasam, almost identical words. Uh, a similar thing happens with the word sindur slash sinduram. So once again, showing how different 
titles within the same series seem to be going in different directions vis-a-vis -vis their understanding of the target reader, vis-a-vis -vis the understanding of who the translated work will be read by. Shock therapy goes further and when we sit down for lunch in shock therapy, it's a very multicultural offering. We get Luci, the word Luci is retained in the Roman script. Luci Begun Bhaja was the original in Bangla. Begun Bhaja is translated into a very anglicized fried aubergine slices. So Luci coexisting with fried aubergine slices and this carries on till dessert where we find the three sweet items, Dorbesh, Rabri and Shandesh being retained in the Roman script but mishti doi and paish being suddenly translated as sweet curds and rice pudding. This seems to be some kind of an inconsistency, some kind of a disjunction uh, in the process of understanding whether to domesticate or to foreignize, how to deal with this alterity. Within the same meal, within the same sentence, we have multiple approaches coexisting. And this, this kind of contradiction uh, really highlights how difficult and how challenging it is to translate from Indian bhashas into English, given the pow power dynamics uh, of these languages uh, today. Uh, there are many, many uh, such examples to show how consistency has not Consistency has sometimes been at a premium when it comes to uh, uh, translations of Indian literature in English. And uh, these bring us to Tejashrini Niranjana's comments about homogenization of a text, where sometimes while translating from an Indian language into English, because of the power because of the existing power dynamics, there are certain trends, certain tendencies that often creep into our translation practice. There is a temptation to English the text almost entirely, thereby robbing the translation of its identity as a text that comes from a non-English uh, culture, a non-English setting. I would like to also talk about the Katha translations. Katha is uh, uh, an NGO publication house that used to exist in Delhi. And uh, the Katha uh, series of translations seem to define their target readership quite unambiguously. This is uh, a series that clearly defines its readership as an Indian reader. And because it does so, the strategies that are adopted by this series are like this. Sorry. The Katha translations consistently retain kinship terms. So there is no giving in to uncle. It's always kaka, chacha, piche, and so on and so forth. Moreover, the Katha translations seldom use italics or any other signposting devices. Perhaps the reason behind that is many of the words that are retained would make sense across many of the languages in, in India. Again, when it comes to the treatment of the local ingredients, Katha translations seem to privilege the regional to the standard, quote unquote. So when you have a Bangla work being translated into English, the Bangla word kumkum would be retained as kumkum in the Roman script. When a Malayalam work or a Tamil work is translated into English, the word there would be kumkumam. And there, it would be kumkumam that would be retained. So there is a privileging of the regional variation that the Katha translation policy seems to do. But this is not always the case. This is very different from uh, the Srishti policy. Srishti is another publication house uh, based in Delhi, which brings out a series of translations. One notes, for instance, this example 
of this anthology of Odia short stories, where we encounter the words Kolijugo. Kolijugo is one of the ages in Hindi, Hindu mythology. And Kolijugo, which is the Oriya version, is immediately glossed as Kaliyug, which is the Hindi version of Kolijugo. So the regional Oriya version is seen to be subsumed within the more quote unquote standard Hindi version over here. So that is a, a, an approach to translation that is at odds with, that is quite, quite different from the approach that Katha employs to its translations. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed this one. Uh, reading the introductory note, to Katha Price Stories 1 is quite instructive in this regard. Rimli Bhattacharya, who is the co-editor of the first volume of Katha Price Stories. Price Stories is this volume that um, they used to bring out every year, where one story would be selected from each language, stories published in that calendar year. So the first volume has this introductory note in which Rimli Bhattacharya enunciates the, the idea of the target reader that Katha tries to deal with, which is the Indian reader or the subcontinental reader, who is familiar with at least some of the codes and beliefs and signifiers. And therefore, there is a conscious attempt to abjure glossaries. So the words either would make sense to Indian readers in other languages, or perhaps the context would be such that from the context, one could understand what these words would imply, even if one didn't understand the dictionary meaning. Now, this is very different from the strategies used by uh, other publications like Macmillan, for instance, as we shall see shortly. Uh, Macmillan brought out a very productive series of I let Indian literature in English translations. This was a series of small novels from different Indian languages. It was called the Minute series, Modern Indian Novels in Translation. This was a huge success because it made a very large number of very powerful texts from the Indian bhashas accessible through translation into English. More than a hundred books, if I remember correctly. So there was this treasure trove of Indian literature that suddenly became available and accessible to readers in English translation. Mini Krishnan, experienced uh, translation activist, uh, she was at the helm, she pioneered this series. And she writes in her introduction that this series targets both Indian and non-Indian readers. Now, it is not important per se whether a book of translation targets an Indian reader or a non-Indian reader. But what is important is the compromises you make, the strategies you undertake in your quest to satisfy the needs of your perceived reader. And what happens uh, in this series of books is that it takes on the onus of explaining explicitly kinship terms, of course, but also words like the ones that are highlighted over here on the screen. So even a word like sari would be explained uh, over the course of four or five lines or sentences. Detailed explanations of culture-specific markers like this. Now, this can be seen as an attempt to meet the perceived demands of the non-Indian target language reader perhaps, but this can sometimes take on uh, very complicated incarnations as we shall see in the next slide. Two Bangla novels by Shunil Kongopadhyay, Shorgen Niche Manush and Chubok Chuboti, translated into English and published from Rupa. We see here that references to Boitoroni, 
mythical river are explained in terms of its resemblance to the Styx of Greco-Roman mythology. So in explaining Boitoroni, the translator would go and try and look for a parallel from Western culture, Western civilization. This is very different from the Katha approach to translation. Again, the word Trishul is glossed in this way. The, the trident or the Trishul, chosen weapon of Lord Shiva in Hindu mythology, but again, to make things easier for the perceived foreign reader, we have the addition of the line, also the weapon of Zeus and Poseidon of Greek mythology. So Shiva being explained in terms of Zeus and Poseidon, one form of domestication perhaps. Likewise, there are other examples of the same strategy where things that are Indian, things that are culture specific are sought to be explained in terms of the Western traditions. We have encountered the word, word kochuri in the translation of the Bangla text that we had mentioned by Muti Nundi, Kochuri and Chilipi. And we see how different an approach it is over here. The translator explains Kochuri uh, in terms of what it is made of and how it is prepared and so on and so forth. So clearly the target readership is different and clearly there is an attempt to bridge the gap by making things easier for the target reader to understand India as it were. So there are many different ways of looking at this strategy. One wonders whether it ends up reducing the source language text to a footnote, which has to be understood only in comparison with Western norms. Or is it merely an attempt to communicate the text to a new audience, which is the core of translation? Does it, by making things easier for the reader, facilitate greater communication? and dissemination, which after all is what we want to do when we translate Indian literature into English. The critic has to decide between these two uh, uh, readings of this strategy. However, what we cannot forget is the statement about how, as we become more and more aware of unequal power relations, we need to re-examine our translation strategies as well. Perhaps the time has come to understand translation in terms of its politics when it comes to the translation of Indian literature in English, more so as it, is, as it becomes more and more visible, more so as it becomes more and more an organic part of the classroom in the humanities departments in India. Wading through different titles of Indian Bhasha literature in English translation, we come across many, many such examples of markers being annotated in a certain way. Annotations that would probably strike the Indian reader mostly as redundant and trite. Very few Indian readers would need to uh, would need many of these things here to be explained in these terms. And uh, the prescriptive element of translations is again something that recurs. For instance, the second last example that you have on your screen. Brass utensils are very common in Indian homes and everyone receives a set in his or her marriage. It becomes, uh, it assumes a tone of the prescriptive as it were. These are dangerous for cross-cultural understanding. So what we really see is that various complicated contradictory factors uh, work themselves into the exercise of translating Indian Bhasha literature into English. 
questions related to linguistic hegemony, questions related to decolonization, globalization, which happens in the 1990s, which sets off a different attitude to translation, perhaps, cultural imperialism, all of these work themselves into the act of translating Indian Bhasha literature into English. It's a particularly complicated area and uh, it becomes so complicated, so contradictory, so exciting, precisely because of the multilingual canvas of India, the multicultural canvas of India, and also because of the ambiguous location of the English language in India. Because on one hand, the English language can still be associated with colonialism, with uh, uh, memories of Macaulay's infamous statement. But on the other hand, the English language is also the language of power in contemporary India. It is the language of aspirations. It opens up vistas of opportunities. So this kind of an ambiguous location is what makes uh, translation of Indian Bhasha literature into English even more complicated. And that is why it is so important that we interrogate the politics of translation in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Sayantan. <clears throat> that was wonderful. Some, some really lovely examples there and a, a beautifully wide ranging introduction to these issues. Um, there have been some questions coming in already on the chat. Thank you for those. Do please uh, keep adding your questions and I will put them to uh, Shayantan now in our question session. We have in principle uh, around half an hour or so. So we, we do have, uh, uh, ought to have plenty of time to cover all of your questions. Um, I wonder if I could uh, uh, start by asking you Shayantan about your own um, uh, your own practice as a uh, as a an editor uh, and as a, a translator, whether you uh, yourself are looking to put uh, particular principles uh, into practice then through your own work? Ah, that is probably the most difficult question to answer. Sorry, because... I, I thought I'd kick off with an easy one there, <laughs> but uh, you've, been, you've been giving us some wonderful examples of other, other presses and other uh, translators. And I, I, I wonder if, if, if you uh, had any, uh, were able to complement uh, your, your presentation with thoughts of a more personal nature. Yes, I think, uh, I think it's very difficult to uh, bring together translation theory and translation practice. There is so much that you can critique when you look at a work of translation. There is always so much that one can say and so much that has been said about losses in translation and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's seldom that we talk about the gains of translation, which is really what we need to do. But when one translates himself or herself, uh, it is very difficult to keep uh, in mind those very injunctions that as a critic you might come up with. So um, I'm sure all translators who critique other translations end up making the same kind, taking the same kind of strategies once in a while in their own translations. So uh, it's, it's really something that uh, I think needs to be taken on a case to case basis, being cautious uh, being extra cautious is the only thing that you can be. Uh, try and questioning uh, yourself uh, in the choices that you're making. That's the, that's the only thing that you can be. And particularly when one translates uh, uh, literary texts from um, strata, from communities, from contexts that are very different from your own. That is when I think uh, uh, a particular uh, amount of uh, caution needs to come in. I'm talking about translating Dalit literature, for instance, mm -hmm. because uh, Dalit literature has its own dynamics in terms of its aesthetics, its politics, and unless one is really clued into those contexts, it is very foolhardy to take up translation of the lit literature. So, uh, you know, the context, the kind of text will really dictate the kind of problems that the translator would have. And the kind of attitudes, the strategies that one would have to devise. Uh, trans that's what makes translation so exciting, I think, because there is no one norm, there is no one prescription that we can follow. It always uh, varies from text to text and context to context. 
Thank you, Shayantan. Can I uh, ask a, a question um, from the chat from Aniket Mohapatra? In what ways uh, do the turn of the century translation practices that you've been describing affect the parameters and principles in evaluating a translation? Yes. Um, I think uh, one of the things that has happened is, you know, I was talking about the 1990s and the first decade of this uh, millennium. Uh, but uh, there is substantially more that has happened. We've seen a couple of decades after that. So it might be instructive to look at translations of Indian literature in English that are published after the period that I'm looking at and seeing whether there are differences, different patterns that emerge, whether there is a qualitative moving away in terms of the understanding of post-colonial translation, whether or not the balance of payments has changed in terms of the translations, whether or not the relationship that is envisaged between the source language text and the readership whether that has changed. And of course, the other is in terms of the academic response. Yes, I think, I th I think it is a fact that Indian literature in English translation has now been evaluated. It is being evaluated. I mentioned Rita Kothari. Uh, she has this excellent book on translating India. Uh, you know, that's just one. There are, there, are, there are so many scholars, there are so many scholars who are looking at how Indian literature is being translated into English. And, and the kind of criticism that is coming up from those studies is obviously going to also impact the translations themselves, I would think. So uh, it's, it's very important to interrogate these traditions so, so that we understand where we can go after that. Um, just a reminder, we had uh, an early question in the chat about where this recording will be available afterwards. And uh, my colleague, uh, BCLT manager Anna Good, has posted the, uh, the link to the BCLT YouTube channel. So um, if you want to check the chat and copy that, uh, then uh, a recording of the, the, the whole of uh, today's session will be available there from next week. Um, first out of the blocks was uh, Anjali Ramnani uh, with a very uh, broad question. And I, I uh, hope, Shayantan, uh, you won't mind my asking you a, a very broad question like this, but it's about translation history and cultural history. How can Anjali ask, how can can translation history serve as an alternative cultural history? I think it's a really interesting question, a very wide ranging one. I don't know if you, you'd like to comment on that. Uh, well, I'm, sh I'm, I'm not sure if uh, the way I understand it is uh, really what, uh, well, I think uh, in the context of uh, a country like India, particularly, where you have so many languages and where we have seen the impact of many other non-Indian languages as well on our cultural traditions, it's very important to take a wider view of things, a more holistic view, which is why this moving away from the single language axis in terms of our pedagogy in the humanities is so important. Because if one really wishes to understand the cultural, literary, political history of of India, uh, of any part of India, it is impossible to do so really uh, by restricting ourselves to only the one tradition. Because all these traditions feed on each other and foreign influences as well. So the only way one can really get a more holistic idea of the evolution of culture uh, is really by taking a more in-breadth perspective. Uh, it is through translations that literary and cultural traditions are formed, formulated, and they evolve. If Shakespeare had not been translated into Indian languages uh, to the extent that, it, that he was, if Moliere had not been translated into Indian languages to the extent that he was, then Indian languages Indian literatures would not have taken the trajectory that they have. So it is very important to look at translations in terms of how they impact different literary and cultural traditions. You cannot get away without looking at translations. Excellent. 
thank you, Chayan Tan. Um, next question uh, from uh, Annie Sibi, uh, who asks, this might seem redundant, but could you talk more about the dangers of prescriptivism while translating, particularly to the Anglophone audience? Yes. Um, prescriptivism would really result in museumizing the source language culture in a way. This example that I gave, for instance, the one about Sindur, uh, there is this translation where Sindur is explained in this way. It is vermilion powder, which is worn by uh, Hindu women, uh, sorry, worn by Indian women. All married women have to wear Sindur on the parting of their hair. So this becomes completely prescriptive. And it means that if uh, a woman doesn't put Sindur on her parting, then she is not really part of that community. Whereas this is not entirely true because India is constituted by many different religions and Sindur is not associated with all the religions of India. So that, that becomes uh, a generalization. Moreover, even within the community where the custom of wearing Sindur exists, it is not as if in India today, all women sport uh, Sindur, not even all married women. So what you're doing is there's, there's a kind of gender stereotyping, gender pressurizing that is working into this kind of prescription where a particular vision of India is propagated. So that is uh, the danger of the kind of prescriptive, prescriptivism that I'm talking about. Thank you. Um, a, a question from uh, Nivadita. What are your comments on the Penguin translations from Indian Pashas available in light paperback editions, especially about the strategies and intended audience? Uh, yes. Uh, once again, I don't want to uh, get into a generalization because Penguin has uh, a whole number of titles and uh, there are different approaches that you that you find. There are, there, there are very different approaches. But sometimes uh, uh, the idea of the intended audience does seem to shape the translation in ways that take away from the spirit, the temper of the original. For instance, um, I'm thinking of uh, the Penguin uh, Bunkim Chandro Omnibus, which exists in two volumes, I, th I think, paperback editions with three or four novels together in them. Now, Bunkim Chandro is a Bengali writer uh, uh, is credited with having ushered in the novel writing tradition in India through his Bangla works. But Bunkim Chandro's Bangla is quite convoluted. It's a Sanskritized Bangla. Uh, the sentences are heavy, long-winded, and as a contemporary Bangla-speaking reader, many would have trouble negotiating those sentences because the register of language is very, very different. It's, it's archaic. Uh, some of us Bangla readers would need to resort to the dictionary once in a while. But if one looks at the Penguin translations, the translations of Wong Kim Chandra that come out from Penguin, they read like James Adley Chase thrillers, short, succinct sentences, not too many heavy words. It's very light reading. You know? So the temper of Wong Kim Chandra's writing seems to disappear in that kind of a translation. So, uh, but then again, I, I'm talking about one example. There are many other examples where this does not happen, where the source language text, the temper of the writer, the style of the writer is kept in mind. So it varies from title to title. <clears throat> talking about uh, Penguin then, uh, am I right in thinking that these are published by Penguin India and distributed uh, mainly within India, because I was wondering about um, the with the various series that you uh, uh, that you introduce. Um, how many of those have a distribution uh, outside of India, and um, whether 
that will also play into the translation strategy. I'm sure. It, I'm sure it would. But my my sense was that these were the at least the presses you were uh, uh, talking about mainly distribute within India. Uh, yes, that is the uh, that is the curious thing that even when a publisher has limited distribution network internationally, uh, when the translations are being made, uh, very often we see the temper of the translation seems to indicate uh, a non-Indian readership. Mm. So there seems to be a disjunction there between uh, the publisher, the editor, and the translator. The translator's realization or estimate or understanding of who this translation is going to reach to may not be realistic in terms of the distribution reach of the publisher concerned. Thank you. Um, a question now uh, from Ananya Bhattacharya, who says, thank you so much for such an enriching lecture. When it comes to interrogating the politics of translation in exotropic translation, I think that translators do want to foreignize culture specific terms in the source text as much as possible. I wonder if domesticate was intended there because um, uh, Ananya goes on to say, um, if they find the equivalent or related terms in the target language, as happened in the case of Begun Bhaja as fried aubergine slices. Uh, but that could not be done in case of uh, Luki. Foreignizing a term like that would inevitably make the process prescriptive. Then how can one strike a balance between these two situations? Yes, I think uh, this is the problem. Uh, we, we, uh, when we talk about uh, translation in India, um, we keep going back to theorizations and principles such as foreignization and domestication. But uh, if we think carefully, the terms foreignization and domestication may not apply to the Indian context in the way that they apply to Europe because foreignization domestication may be used for a context where foreign texts are being translated into one's own language in Europe. But in the Indian context, when we are translating from a bhasha into English, then the dynamics are very different, which is foreignization and which is domestication. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, to address the question, the direct question that you have, uh, yes, as I said, it's, it's very uh, difficult to reconcile uh, critiquing a translation with the act of translation itself. Uh, I would not like to try and uh, think about what could have been the option. But my point here is that uh, there seems to be a disjunction over here if Luci is coupled with fried aubergine slices because the attitude to translation does not seem to bear out any kind of consistency. In any case, the word aubergine is uh, very, very English. Uh, in the Indian context for Begun, um, aubergine is not a word that I have heard very often. The, the word brinjal comes more easily to mind. So for, for a Bangla reader, reader perhaps uh, aubergine would need to be translated back to brinjal and then to Begun uh, for, for many of us. But uh, the point is, yes, it's, it's difficult to deal with culture specific markers, with food items, with flora and fauna. But then that is the task of the translator. And one can't really prescribe a way out here, except to say that perhaps it hits you when you have luci with fried aubergine slices and dorbesh with uh, uh, rice pudding. So that, that sentence just knocks the translation off a little bit, I think. It, it strikes me as well that uh, talking about aubergine, um, you say it's very English, it's very British English as well, isn't it? I mean, I'm just thinking that that translation would need to be edited for an American readership um, uh, who would uh, presumably an editor would want to uh, substitute uh, eggplant. Um, and so in, in a sense, there's, there's, there's another stage to making that translation work in a, in a world English uh, context maybe. Um, but let's move on to um, a, a question from Ahana. Uh, an observation, in fact, recently a book titled A Burning by Mega Majumda won a lot of uh, accolades in the national and international literary circles for its depiction of rising right-wing tendencies in the Indian political scene. 
uh, following your observations on how words and tendencies associated with the Southeast Asian reality are often given a Western context to meet the requirements of the readership, it struck me how the sustained admiration and acceptance of Indian writers who give into this practice and their valor valorization by the Western publishing houses and their Indian counterparts is an ongoing one. Um, so I don't know if you would like to, to comment on that, Chayantan. Uh, well, I, I, I suppose uh, it's the South Asian context that uh, you are talking about. Uh, um, well, yes, those are, uh, those are some of the political contexts that might work their way into uh, translation. And yes, uh, there's a danger there, but uh, uh, you know, it really depends on how publishers and translators and writers deal with this kind of political context. Mm. Uh, beyond that, I don't think I have much to comment on this. Uh, there's a, there's a question from uh, Rindan Kundu, which uh, links into political themes again. Uh, thank you for a brilliant speech. I'd like to know your standpoint regarding translation of Dalit literature. Do you think that while translating Dalit texts, a translator should act as an activist or should maintain neutrality? What should be the ethical standpoint there? Um, I don't know the answers to these very difficult questions and I would not like to be prescriptive once again because I think that's the most important danger for the translator. A translator should be what he or she wants to be, I think. Uh, a translator needs to be true to his or her own beliefs, yes. But while translating Dalit literature, there's a specific set of problems that will come up. I think it's important to deal with, engage with those problems. And perhaps these questions can come in tangentially there. For instance, when, uh, uh, when you are translating Dalit literature into English, very often uh, writers of Dalit literature use registers of language that are different from what is generally accepted as mainstream uh, uh, in that sense. So the, the, the Bangla that Kollani uh, uh, Charal uh, might use uh, might be slightly different from the literary Bangla that is expected from the Sharudiya Shankhas and so on and so forth, the Puja uh, special numbers. So uh, it is a question of how you deal with that language at one level. So that's the first, that's the first point, language itself. Uh, a writer like Munoranjun Bapari uh, in Bangla, who, uh, was, uh, who used to earn his living by pulling rickshaws. He uh, picked up the art of writing, became literate fairly later on in his life and then started writing. And there's a particular brand of Bangla that he uses. At first glance, some might dismiss this as incorrect Bangla. But for the translator, he or she needs to decide what to do with these incongruities, with these differences in the use of language. Is it to be bulldozed over and converted into proper English? Or are these nuances to remain, to bring out you know, the, the original context of the writer, his life, uh, and, and, and really the culture that the story emerges from. But language is really only one part of it, the experience, the culture specificities of the lives that are being portrayed in Dalit literature, how to engage with those, how to bring those nuances through. That is the challenge for the translator translating it into English because the English language may not succumb very easily, may not yield very easily to encapsulating the realities of Dalit literature. So I think those are the challenges and there perhaps Slita needs to take a stand on what to do with these differences. That is, that is the uh, ethics that I think the translator needs to worry about. Thank you, Shayan Tan. Um, a follow-up question from um, Annie Sibi. Uh, what are the possibilities of looking at translated texts as if it's an original text? Uh, also, looking at ideologies behind the act of translation, for instance, political and cultural climate of Kerala saw a huge influx of Malayalam translations of South American and Russian literature, particularly in the late 20th century. I don't know 
uh, if, uh, there, there's a, a number of issues there, but uh, uh, um, the, the possibility of looking at translated text as if it's an original text. Uh, well, um, it's difficult uh, from the context of academia to think of translated texts, look at translated texts as if they are original texts, because of course, when you're teaching a text in the classroom, it's a different ball game altogether. But yes, the creative element of the translator is always there. And uh, some translators might take liberties enough. And for the reader, it's possible to think of it as an original text, but I'm not very sure of the ethics of doing that. But the second part um, of, of, of the question, yes, uh, uh, ideologies are of course very, very important for translation. Uh, you mentioned the case of uh, Malayalam. Uh, well, in Bengal, uh, a very curious thing happened in the 1980s and 1990s, which uh, you remember is the same time when we have the emergence of Indian literature in English translation in such a big way. Side by side with the emergence of ILET, we see a concerted effort to translate non-English writings into Bangla. So I was mentioning Manubindru Bandupadhyay, uh, the translator, scholar, academic, who translated extensively into Bangla. And if we look at the oeuvre that he has produced, uh, there is very little of English literature that he translates into Bangla. His focus is on Latin America, the Caribbean, on Eastern Europe, on Africa. These are the areas from which he brings literature into Bangla. In fact, he is credited with having introduced the Bangla reader to Yuan Rulfo, to Holub, to a host of other writers, Katsya Marquez, and so on and so forth. So there is a conscious stance over there, again, ideology at play. Uh, there is an attempt to combat what Manubindra Bandupadhyay perceives as Eurocentrism. And the, and the way he tries to combat it is by looking away from Western Europe, looking away from English literature and trying to bring within the purview of the Bangla literary system, literatures from other spaces. And the politics of translation is very clear there as well. So what you, what you mentioned in Malayalam seems to have a direct reflection in Bangla also there. And uh, it, it, it is no surprise there that uh, Manubendra Bandhupadhyay in the 1990s uh, pioneers this annual publication called Horbola. And Horbola is meant as a publication for young readers in Bangla, which would feature translations of young people's writings from, uh, from Asia, from Africa, from South America, from West, uh, Eastern Europe. So once again, there is this attempt to build up an archive of alternative literature in translation, alternative to what is already available, the English literature. Okay. Uh, so I agree with you entirely about how ideologies color the act of translation. Translation is always a political act in so many, many different ways. And this is one of the ways in which I think uh, uh, the politics of translation manifests itself. I wonder if I can uh, ask you a, a question, um, a, a, again, quite a, a wide ranging question, but one which it, uh, occurs to me um, about your role as an educator here. Um, I began by asking you about your, your role uh, uh, as in publishing uh, translations and editing translations. Um, would you want to draw conclusions from the trends that you've been talking about uh, in your presentation uh, today. Would you want to uh, draw conclusions for um, the education of translators, uh, whether in India uh, and uh, in your own university or beyond? Are there, there uh, things which, in other words, uh, are you uh, educating translators not only to analyze these trends, but also to contribute to these trends or perhaps to resist these trends? Uh, yes, um, absolutely, because uh, you see, India, in a way, 
constitutes the most fertile ground for translation, given the number of languages and literatures that we have. But it is quite ironic that we are yet to take translation seriously enough, given the context. Uh, the translation industry in India, many would say, is still uh, an unorganized industry. Uh, the ethics of translation, ethics of publication, uh, the ethics of dissemination, training of translators, all of these are areas where uh, there's a lot of ground we need to cover. Uh, I think uh, a comparison with the UK uh, situation would make things very clear. I understand there is something called the Translators Association uh, in the UK, which talks about translation as a trade. And uh, it talks about the rights of the translator, recommends uh, certain uh, things that the translators should insist upon in a contract and so on and so forth. Uh, we are yet to have anything of that sort in the Indian context and translation remains to a very large extent a labor of love for many, many people. What this means is that translation is yet to become a career for most people. There are exceptions, of course, but uh, by and large, translation is not yet taken seriously in terms of financial remuneration, in terms of even recognition. Of course, we have moved away from the times when uh, uh, translated books were published without the names of the translators. Uh, the context of Kerala came up in Annie's uh, 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 interjection. Uh, I, I have heard many in Kerala uh, from the older generation mentioning that they grew up thinking Sharat Chandra Chattopadhyay, the Bengali writer, was actually a Malayali writer who wrote in Malayalam. Because Sharat Chandra's works were extensively translated into Malayalam. And in most cases, the translator was not given the credit. So these books went into Kerala as works, original works written in Malayalam. We have left those times behind. Now at least the translator gets his or her due in terms of the visibility, but uh, there is still much more to do for translation to be taken more seriously. Yes, training of translators is a must because we, have, we don't really have a corpus of trained translators. There's so much that happens out of love, that's good, but sometimes that's not good enough. So yes, I agree with you that we need centers to take up training of translators more seriously, and we need to disseminate a culture of translation more widely than we have been able to. Because given the kind of resources in terms of language and literature that we have in India, there's an immense amount of work that can and need, needs to be done, even within the Indian context only. Uh, one final question, perhaps. Uh, uh, Annie Sibi has been a particularly enthusiastic questioner and has a, a final question for you, uh, uh, which is this. How do translations convey uh, dialectal variations of a language, particularly since dialect reflects class, caste, and religious backgrounds? Yes, uh, again, Annie, I wish I knew the answer to this question. It is such a vexing question because there are so many stories in Bangla where two registers of Bangla are used, the Bangal Bangla and the Ghoti Bangla, for instance, which is uh, the Bangla that is used across the border in Bangladesh and the Bangla that is used in Bengal in India. Now, when we encounter a Bangla story when, where we have two characters using these two different versions of Bangla, very clearly, without the narrator telling us so, we are looking at two different people with two different backgrounds, with, with two different histories. Very often, this would hark back to the history of partition. You know, when you have these two people conversing, you, you, you could actually be talking about the refugee uh, crisis that emerged, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, that, that history. Now, when 
we translate this kind of a story from Bangla into English, what are we to do with these different uh, registers of language that coexist in the, in, in, in the text? I really don't know the answer. Because if, if we are to use one register of English, then obviously this entire uh, context, this entire baggage goes down the drain. There's no way the reader would understand that. But is it possible to use uh, language in such a way that this history comes through? Or do we have to just resort to some kind of an annotation to explain this background? It's, it's a very vexing question. And uh, I'm sure translators uh, have done their best to deal with such questions and they will continue to do so. No, no one way that one can prescribe, of course. Well, now, um, I think we have covered all the questions that have come up in the chat. It's always good to end with an open question, as Shantan has just done. But uh, Shantan, you've, you've answered so many uh, uh, questions uh, so uh, interestingly and so inspiringly. Um, uh, we, we must uh, uh, let you, um, uh, let you uh, conclude. And uh, you've been very generous with your time. Um, let me, before we conclude, though, uh, just uh, mention a few things that are coming up uh, uh, after Christmas and uh, start off with a date for your diaries, which is the 19th of May, when Shantan will be speaking again as part of a, a series which is uh, coordinated by the University of East Anglia and uh, specifically as part of a series of dialogues on decolonization. Uh, which are going to be taking place uh, after Christmas. Uh, Shantan then will be in conversation with my DCLT colleague Cecilia Rossi uh, and under the heading what is participatory curriculum development. That's on the 19th of May. Um, do look out uh, after Christmas as well for the uh, our advertisement of the Charles Wallace India Trust Translation Fellowship for 2021. I mentioned that uh, Shantan is an uh, alumnus of that uh, scheme and uh, will be advertising uh, after Christmas for uh, applications for the 2021 Charles Wallace uh, India Trans Translation Fellowship. Uh, if, uh, as I mentioned at the top, if you don't yet uh, receive DCLT newsletters, then do uh, log on to our website and you'll be able to sign up for newsletters, which will also tell you about the continuation of our research seminar series after Christmas. And uh, it will be featuring, for example, uh, our translator in residence, Olivia Helliwell, who will be uh, kicking off uh, our series after Christmas. Uh, the series will also include a presentation by our new Leverhulme Early Career Fellow, uh, Sophie Stevens. Um, those are uh, delights for after Christmas. Um, it's been a delight to hear uh, Shantan uh, this afternoon. And uh, can I uh, invite you all to join me in thanking uh, Shantan for a splendid uh, presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, um, at the beginning of the questions, uh, the recording of this event will be available on the BCLT YouTube channel from next week. But uh, for the moment, thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Uh, I hope you'll uh, be back to hear more BCLT research seminars after Christmas. And thank you once again to Sayantan Dasgupta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duncan.